Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we are going to talk about pigmentary disorders as a continuation in our dermatology series. Pigmentation means the coloring of the skin. The degree of pigmentation is caused by different levels of melanin in the skin. Melanin is a natural pigment that determines the color of our skin, hair and eyes. How much melanin we can find in these tissues is dependent on genetic factors, but also sun exposure, hormone levels, but also pathological changes like trauma or injury. If there is a disorder in the pigmentation of the skin, it is either of hypomelanosis, meaning that the skin is less pigmented than the rest of the patient's body, or of the type of hypermelanosis, meaning that the skin darkens. Hypopigmentation can be differentiated into three types. The first one is melanopenic hypomelanosis, where the number of melanocytes is not changed, but the presence of melanin is reduced. Examples of these disorders are albinism or depigmented nevus. The second type is melanos melanocytopenic, where melanocytes are absent. An example for that is vitiligo. The last type is post-inflammatory leukoderma. As mentioned earlier, one of the exemplary diseases leading to hypomelanosis of the skin is vitiligo. It is an acquired disorder of the skin and mucous membranes presenting with local or disseminated hypopigmentation of the skin. It is thought to be of autoimmunological polygenic origin and mechanical irritation is triggering the skin reaction leading to depigmentation, which is irregular, asymmetric, and sharply demarcated. The irritation of the skin leads to destruction of melanocytes and so eventually to discoloration of the skin. The disease is progressive as every irritation will lead to a new local discoloration. Besides the classic dark skin, white skin form, there also exists the trichrome variant or between the depigmented center and the peripheral unchanged skin, there is an area of partially discolored skin, so the skin will effectively present with a dark tone, a tan tone and a white tone. The presentation, however, depends on the natural tone of the patient's skin. Patient's hair also often grows in a white color at the places where the skin is hypopigmented. The next hypomelanotic disorder I want to talk about is oculocutaneous albinism. It is actually a group of disorders rather than a single disease. It affects the skin, hair and eyes which present with a reduction or complete lack of melanin. It is a genetic disorder in which patients have a mutation in the tyrosinase gene which is responsible for the production of melanin in the melanocytes. So the melanocytes are present but non-functional, while in vitiligo the melanocytes are destroyed. Depending on the mutation, there can either be a complete lack of melanin, where patients have white hair and skin, a little bit of melanin, where patients have a creamy white skin color and yellow hair, or they might have very lightly tan skin and light brown hair. Patients also often experience ophthalmologic symptoms like nystagmus and iris translucency. Hypermelanotic disorders are quite the contrary to hypomelanotic disorders. Here patients experience a change to a darker skin color in the affected areas. Chloasma is an example for hypermelanosis. It is a benign hyperpigmentation of the skin, which usually affects patients with a darker natural skin. Women are much more frequently affected Around 90% of patients are women. Some women experience a temporary form of chlosma during pregnancy, which will disappear after the pregnancy is over. Other forms of chlosma only rarely disappear. The skin presents with a yellow-brownish discoloration of unregular shape and size. It is often symmetrical in the area of the forehead, cheeks and nose. The etiology is multifactorial and it is thought that oestrogen, progesterone, melanocyte-stimulating hormone 
and adrenocorticotropic hormone play a key role, together with UV exposure. Approximately 50% of patients report a positive family history, so there seems to be a genetic predisposition. Patients are advised to avoid direct sunlight, to avoid or terminate the intake of hormonal contraceptives, and to use a strong sunblock, especially in the face and arms. Another form of hypermelanosis is melasma. It is provoked by estrogens, so artificial substitution in the form of oral contraceptives or other hormonal contraceptives and hormone replacement therapies are the leading cause of melasma. It is a diffuse, sharply demarcated hyperpigmentation of sun-exposed areas, so mostly the face and arms. The pigmentation can range from yellowish tan to dark brown spots. Depigmentation creams with 2-5% hydrocyan can be used. A slight improvement can be seen after months, but the initial appearance of the skin is usually not restored. The last cause of hyper or hypopigmentation I want to talk about is inflammation. Inflammatory disorders affecting the skin trigger melanocytes to produce and release an increased amount of pigment granules which lead to darkening of the skin. The affected skin will shed over time, so after two to four years, the hyperpigmentation will improve or even be invisible. A professionally guided skin care can help to accelerate the process. This process is more frequently observed than post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. In post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, the melanocytes are damaged or destroyed and are non-functional, so also cannot produce melanin. It is often more prominent in naturally darker skin tones and can occur with any skin injury, no matter if it is burns, surgery, acne or dermatitis. If you haven't seen dermatitis video yet, you can click on the banner above. Creams with a high content of benzoyl peroxide can also lighten the skin, so it can be helpful to stop those creams if a patient experiences local hypopigmentation. In less severe cases, the skin will restore its natural pigmentation by itself. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would be very happy about a subscription. Thank you very much.